scripture before the lesson is from Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 20. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Good morning. It's a cheery parable, isn't it? I told Ted this morning about that verse. I, I couldn't read it out loud because I laugh every time. I mean, you know, they say that it's not good to talk to yourself, like out loud. It's even worse if you answer yourself the questions that you ask yourself. Well, that guy in this parable, it's just a story, but still, I find it too funny. The soul, he's talking to his own soul. I've never done that. I think that's the ultimate sign of losing your mind is talking to your own soul in that kind of way. You know, soul... You've done well for yourself. Anyway, I uh, wanted to announce again, to remind us all, we have a day of prayer coming up. There is a sign-up sheet uh, on the Welcome Center out there. There is a box for you to deposit an index card if you have a specific prayer request you'd like for us to mention. We know that prayer is powerful and prayer works and it is effective, and so we want to have an entire 24 hours of prayer here at the building. And so please uh, see the Welcome Center and all the information is out there for you, so keep that in mind. If you've got any questions, I am not the person to ask. There is a lady named Becca Nelson here. I'll call her out one more time. Uh, she has the information as well as all the elders. We'll get the information you require. How about that? Does that work? Okay. If not, sorry. All right, we're going to the book of James. Uh, next week will be the day after our song fest event here at the building. And so Keith Lancaster will be here leading songs. Yep. And he will talk about unity during Bible class. Yep. Sure. I'll let him know it's what he's doing. Uh, but for the sermon, he said to keep my sermon kind of short so they would have more time to sing with the congregation. I'm not offended. I see where he's coming from, but I know if I get into James chapter 5, it's not going to be a short sermon. So we're going to knock out James chapter 4 this morning together. Uh, I've only got a handful of verses, so it must be a short sermon, right? How could I stretch this to be longer than 20 minutes? We're about to find out. Y'all ready? All right, James chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. So last week we talked about the idea of someone being on the fence, not all in for Jesus in the way of godliness, and not all in for being from or of the world. And so someone that's trying to straddle that line of enjoying some things that are worldly while also reaching out to God and trying to enjoy godliness. And so we, we dealt with that, but at the very last section, beginning in verse 13 of James chapter 4, uh, we find that he transitions to something else from this original context, and he has very little to say about it. So there's not a whole lot of content for us, but the actual topic itself, I think, is very pertinent for all of us and how we think about life. So I'm going to just skip through my recap because, uh, hey, it's there for you if you want it. You better pause the video. There's last week. Here, here's this week. Ready? Okay. James chapter 4, verse 13. Let's begin reading the text itself, then I'll go back and make a couple of comments. Verse 13. Come now, you who say... Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a, yield, a year there and trade and make a profit. So he talks about the conversation that he must have overheard from time to time. Uh, a lot of the scholars have some questions about whether or not he is uh, discussing a Christian with this mindset or someone that's not a Christian with this mindset. 
I think the context we'll read in just a second tells us it doesn't really matter if you're in the body or outside the body. This mindset itself can be quite dangerous. Uh, I also, by the way, love the fact that it says such and such a town. This is kind of one of those things that this didn't ring like the Bible to me, but it just says doesn't matter what town it is, such and such a town, just a made-up town. We're going to this town, we're going to stay there for a year, we're going to trade and make a profit. And none of that in and of itself is necessarily wrong or sinful or bad or not advisable. The issue is the way that someone's mind wraps around those words and forgets something critical when it comes to the Christian life. Verse 14, here's the problem, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. You have plans for the next year to go to such and such a town, trade there, make a profit, run your business. That's your plan, but you don't even know what the next day will bring, much less the next year. So is making plans a bad idea according to what James has to say? We'll find out. You don't know what tomorrow will bring, verse 14. He asks the question, what is your life? And what a great, short, simple, deep question that is. What is your life? He says, because you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Life is one of those things that we take for granted so often. If you're going through grief right now because you've lost someone that you loved, then you understand this sentiment that life is such a precious gift that we're given. Every moment that God gives us is a special, crucial gift. And we don't know what a great gift it is until we lose someone that we love and we realize all those gifts that we receive from time that God gave us is such a wonderful blessing. And this idea of planning for the next year but not knowing what one day will bring is a biblical concept. This thought in verse 14, you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes, is echoed throughout the rest of the Bible. In Psalm 102, I'm going to read verses 1 through 3 to show you how the psalmist was very much aware of that same idea. Psalm 102 in verse 1, Hear my prayer, O Lord, let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me, answer me speedily in the day when I call. Why? Because my days pass away like smoke and my bones burn like a fire, uh, like a furnace. My heart is struck down like grass and has withered. I forget to eat my bread. We have someone going through a difficult time in life, and they're reaching out to God, asking for assistance, asking for God's care and love to be shown because he feels like his days are just passing away like smoke from an oven. Also, in the book of Job, I'm sure Job felt this way. Sometimes life feels so long when you're in the middle of distress and difficulty, and sometimes it just feels so short. And Job 7.7, 7, Job says these words, Remember that my life is a breath. The idea just passes away. My eye will never again see good. The eye of him who sees me will behold me no more. While your, uh, while your eyes are on me, I shall be gone. As the cloud fades and vanishes, so he who goes down to the pit does not come up. He returns no more to his house, nor does his place know him anymore. And he goes on to say, because I feel like life just ends so suddenly and so, so quickly, I want to tell you what I'm thinking while I'm here. That's kind of Job's mindset in chapter 7 as he's angry. And he wants to express that anger before he loses the opportunity because of his great peril and great distress of why he's suffering so many things unjustly from his perspective. So James says, back into our text, verse 13, there are some who say, here are our plans for the next year. 
Verse 14, you don't even know what one single day is going to bring you. How can you talk in that kind of way? Because we are here for a moment and then we're gone the next. In verse 15, he says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills or desires, we will live and do this or that. So the caveat here from making these kinds of plans is never forgetting who is in control of your life and your destiny. Making plans is not the problem according to the book of James. The problem is the arrogance to say, here are our plans. Whether God wills it or not, this will be done. And that's a problem. Because when that mindset kicks in for all of us, myself included, we begin to think that we have some kind of this control over our lives. And I'm one of the people that I love to know what that control is because it makes me feel like I'm in control even when I'm out of control. I'm just wired that way. I need safety, I need security, I need contingency plans. I'm that way. And sometimes God just wants to remind me, you don't really think you're in charge, do you? Well, here's a wrench for what your plans are. If the Lord wills, we will do this or do that. Verse 16, James calls it what it is. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. Arrogance. It's kind of a harsh word for being a control freak, isn't it? You're arrogant. You can call me a control freak any day of the week. And I'm like, I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm, I'm wired that way. I'm an arrogant person? That's what God says through the book of James. All such boasting is evil. And then in the proper context in verse 17, so whoever knows to do the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Now, control freak is one way to kind of lacquer that in a positive light saying that your arrogance is a bit more harsh, a bit more real, but saying that that kind of mindset of planning for the future and then boasting in what you think your contingency plans are in life is evil and sinful, that's a whole other degree. So what James is doing here in this time capsule of the issues of the first century church is he's addressing what they were thinking, which was wrong. And the problem is, I connect with it too well. (laughs) He's writing to Christians that are humans, just like us. And no doubt, when you look at verses 13 through 17 of James chapter 4, he's not just talking to first century Christians, he's talking to me. I can resonate with this. Making plans, thinking you're in control, being arrogant, and forgetting that God is in control of each of our lives individually, That's a problem that they had. It's a problem that we have. Planning is not the issue. The plan is forgetting who is really in charge. The creator of the entire universe has our lives mapped out for us. There are things that we can do. We can do appropriately, responsibly, but ultimately remember, as Job learned, that he is in control. A few more things I want to say about verse 14, just for a moment. And then we'll close our thoughts out on the book of James, chapter 4. We read Luke chapter 12, verses 16 and 20. Jesus taught that parable of the farmer who was, was blessed so much that his barns could not store all the crops he made for that year. So his great plan was to plan for the future. Not a problem. Tear down those old, old small barns, make new ones. And then he talk to yourself, as apparently you do, and say, soul, you know, you've done well for yourself. Eat, drink, be merry, enjoy the spoils and the fruits of all your labor. That was not a problem, except for the fact that he was rich towards himself, but not rich towards God. That very night that he was making those plans to live on his retirement plan of crops was the night that his life and his soul was required of him. So again, remembering that every day is a difficult process to get. It's a a gift from God. Uh, If you'll remember in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, we have two, two stories or two thoughts in here that reveal the same exact sentiment that James is trying to drive home. 
in the so-called Lord's Prayer or model prayer that Jesus give his, gives his disciples. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 11, part of that prayer is to give us this day our daily bread. Not bread for the week, bread for the month, bread for the year, but every single day asking for that blessing of bread, food to survive one more day as part of the model prayer. And then famously in Matthew chapter 6, in verse 25, Jesus goes into a a lesson here about the idea of anxiety. I know none of us suffer from anxiety about things of this life, right? No, none of us do. Jesus knew we would, because he did, no doubt. Therefore, I tell you, Matthew 6, 25, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Well, the answer is, apparently life is more than food and clothing. These daily things that God knows that we have need of every single day, life is more than just being, having those basic needs being met. In verse 31 of that context, Jesus says, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Because the Gentiles seek after these things. But your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, the daily needs, will be added unto you. And therefore, I love verse 34 so much, Do not be anxious about tomorrow, because tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Well, you got that right. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Sometimes we steal the joy from tomorrow, thinking about it today. Let that anxiety infect us and poison us and rob us from that fact that God knows that we have a need every single day. He cares for us. He loves us. And taking things one day at a time is not only biblical, it's what Jesus told us to do right here in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 34. I'm hesitant to tell you some stories not because they're embarrassing. I love those because, you know, I've got too many of them. I want to tell you real quick. Well, I got, I got five whole minutes. I want to tell you about a man I knew. When I was a 20-year-old whippersnapper, fresh out of preaching school, I was, work, I was preaching for a congregation of 50 souls in West Virginia, a place called Charlestown, not Charleston. Charlestown is on the eastern panhandle right next to Winchester, Virginia, and right next to Hagerstown, Maryland, outside D.C. from the metro, if you know the area at all. And I have never done a funeral, and I was under the impression that I was cool enough to be able to be one of those preachers that just had a thing that they just didn't do. Like there are some preachers who just don't do lectureships or just don't do gospel meetings. And I thought, maybe I'll be one of those preachers that just doesn't do funerals. <laughs> Again, 20-year-old, fresh out of preaching school whippersnapper. You think I'm sarcastic now. You should have met me back then. But we had a member. We had two members, a husband and a wife. And their son... I don't, I don't say was a Marine, he is a Marine, right? Because you never stop being a Marine, I'm told. And he came home to visit his family. He stayed at his parents' house. He was a 40-something-year-old man. And I was around Halloween, and he had dinner with his parents. And he had some, some heartburn that night, some indigestion. And so he told his mom and dad, our members in West Virginia, that he's going to go upstairs and take a nap in, in the room. He went upstairs and lay down. The next morning, his parents went to go wake him up. And that night, when he went upstairs, he had a massive heart attack and died. And so the father and son, or the father and mother came to us at the congregation and said, We are having a funeral service for him. 
and we want you to do the funeral. So I said, absolutely, whatever you want me to do, I'll be happy to do. Where is it going to be? And they go, oh, just down the road. Well, I didn't know until the day of that just down the road was Arlington National Cemetery. And so my first ever funeral that I ever did was in Arlington in Washington, D.C. for a Marine that died from a massive heart attack. And so I did my best. And at the end, um, the father walked over to me, Russ, and he gave me a, a shell, a blank shell from the 21-gun salute and gave it to me and said, I appreciate you doing this for me. I want you to have this as a mento to remember your first funeral service. And I, thank you very much. The application for that particular story is you never know what tomorrow will bring. He came home to visit his parents. He had a meal, didn't feel quite right, and his soul was required of him that night. I got one more and then I'll close out. When we were in West Virginia a couple years later, we had this family that came to church and they brought their whole clan with them. Do you know those kind of people? We got, we got one of those here. I'm not going to look at them, but they're over there. <laughs> they got a clan. When they show up, you've got 50 people coming all together, right? If they're coming to an event, you better plan for 100 people. They, they, these, these clan people bring their whole families with them, and that's great. And so this, this clan wanted to join our congregation, and we had no problem with that whatsoever. And the, the grandma had a son who was a, a grown man. He was about 40 years old as well. And he was not a Christian, and uh, he had a lifestyle that was incongruent with a Christian's lifestyle. And I was asked to have a Bible study with him to show him why his lifestyle was not appropriate in a Christian context. If he wanted to become a Christian, he'd have to change some things about his lifestyle. And so Melissa and I got up there, and we had a lunch with the guy, and we had a Bible study with the guy, and I could tell everything that I was teaching him from the scriptures, he was already very much aware of. He had heard that growing up in the church his entire life. He was thinking about making some changes to his life and becoming a Christian and getting clean, getting sober. And at the end of the study, I said, well, you know, next week we can get together if you'd like. We can have lunch again. We can talk more about this if you're thinking about needing some support to change your life around, I'd be happy to do whatever I can to assist you. And he goes, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to keep thinking about it. I'm not quite sure. Well, at 4 o'clock in the morning, the very next day, I got a call from the mother. And she said, I need you here now. So we got in our car, and at 4 o'clock in the morning, we drove up there, and we got there. There's an ambulance, and there's police officers all over the property. And I said, what happened? And she is just bawling her eyes out, and she just tells me that he's dead. He died that night. They don't know if he was murdered, don't know if it was a, a boyfriend of his that, that murdered him and then drove off. We don't know what happened, but he's gone. A few hours before he died, we had a Bible study, and he was still thinking about maybe becoming a Christian. You never know, folks, when your soul is going to be required of you. And I don't want this to turn into one of those sermons where I feel like I'm trying to guilt someone into making a difference. I'm just reminding all of us that we are never guaranteed one more day on this planet. Every moment that God gives us is a precious gift. We don't know how precious it is until it's over. And we can't become who God wants us to be, who he's paid for us to be through the death of Jesus on the cross. So when James tells us, don't boast in your arrogance about the plans that you think you have time for, God is in control. James knew exactly what he was talking about. What is your life? You are a vapor that is here one moment and is gone the next. While we are gathered together in the Lord's name, the Father, the Spirit, and the Son are here with us as we glorify Him for the great grace He has shown to us to give us this moment to analyze where we are in light of eternity. 
I want you to look in and be honest with yourself. If there is anything that we can do to help you feel more secure in your eternal salvation, that is what we are here unified to do. Encourage each other. Lift each other up. Be there as a family in Christ. If we can pray for you, come talk to me. If you want to see one of our shepherds, they are waiting at the doors for you. If you have any need at all that we can assist with, God's given us this moment to reach out. If you have a need, respond now as we stand and we sing.